Coming up in China, Xiamen City volunteers work with a local hospital to hold a free clinic for residents. And releasing animals into the wild is no longer a good deed, but disrupting our ecosystem and food chain. Welcome to Da Headlines, I'm Wendy Chen, thank you for joining us. First up in China, Xiamen City volunteers worked in partnership with a local hospital to hold a free clinic at the Xiamen City office. In total, over 300 residents received medical help. Here at Xiamen City office, city volunteers are partnering with the local hospital to organize a large-scale free clinic which will be attended by Ciji care recipients and impoverished residents. Uh, After this health checkup, you have to go to see a cardiovascular doctor every week or every two weeks. And remember to take your medication on a regular basis. At the free clinic, over 300 volunteers are on site to help patients get through the health examinations. Among the patients is Su Xiangda, who has suffered ankylosing spondylitis for 12 years. Thanks to Ziji, he finally has an opportunity to get the treatment, with Ziji volunteers traveling over 200 kilometers to get him here. Following a preliminary check, the doctors arranged for Su to get comprehensive examination at a local hospital. Though Su Xiangda will need a long period of treatment before he can recover, he still stays positive and expresses his gratitude to the doctors and volunteers. As the free clinic ends on a perfect note, the body and soul of all patients are tended to. Also holding a free clinic are city volunteers in Brazil who held their first ever free clinic at Vera de Vez Consula City, which is located 40 kilometers outside of Sao Paulo. Let's take a look. This is the first free medical clinic TG volunteers have held in Sao Paulo's Ferraz de Vasconcello City. And many local residents have packed into the venue having seen the event advertised on billboards and radio. Using the school as a temporary clinic, each classroom is transformed into a different department to offer members of the public comprehensive medical service. You've got presbymopia and astigmatism. Due to a lack of health knowledge, minor problems usually spiral into panic. This grandma mistakenly thought that a lip inflammation was a cancer symptom. Luckily, with medical expertise, her worries were put to rest. I'm so grateful to you all. You're doing a wonderful job. You're like rain in an arid desert. Although we are very poor, we were well received by you all. Another group of volunteers conducted home visitations to better understand the living conditions of local residents so to evaluate appropriate assistance for them. The free clinic not only safeguarded the health of local residents, but also brought Siji into their lives, marking the start of a new friendship. After World War II, Japan, like many countries around the globe, went through a period of increased birth rate and had some 8 million babies born between 1947 to 1949. However, when these baby boomers retire, it means a huge reduction in labor as well as a surge in pensions. Here's more. The staff operating the machines in this area include both the young and the old. Their average age is approximately 41. There are heavy items around 20 kilograms, but we don't have to move them all at once. A little past nine in the morning, Dai TV reporters arrive at a photography equipment factory in Kawasaki City, where the company director, who is nearly 70 years of age, gives them a personal tour. One might expect to find the young operating these machines. Nevertheless, here beneath each of the construction helmets are in fact experienced senior staff. 
We only need to type the information into the computer and the machine will run automatically to compress the metal so we don't need to put in any physical strength. Manufacturer department's chief, 64-year-old Tomichi Kato, born a baby boomer, is one of the most experienced staff at the company. In Japan, there's a term which describes those born after World War II between 1947 and 1949. There are a total of more than 8 million baby boomers who are said to have played a vital role in the 70s when Japan's economy took off. 63-year-old Kiyoshi Yamazaki, who has 40 years of experience, is also the heart and soul of this company. Manufacturing means adjusting to the customer's needs. I probably know most of the staff and the whole manufacturing department. For Yamazaki and Kato, as long as their company needs them, both will happily work even after they turn 65. The company director, Kaoru Hanada, sees these senior staff as old friends and is willing to keep them by his side. It is the responsibility of corporations to hire senior staff. It is something which we will support. Before they might receive higher pay, but when they age, their pay will be less because we can combine it with their pensions. <laughs> Facing a declining birth rate, the Japanese government ruled out that beginning in April of next year, the business sector must provide the opportunity of full-time jobs to those above 65. However, the changes in employment also means lifetime employment rates went from 80 percent to only 65. As Japan's economy fluctuates, large corporations who hired many staff when the economy was booming began cutting down their expenses. We have a few staff that retire from large corporations in our company. If seniors' employees stay in the workforce, besides the pay cuts, other issues also exist. The director next takes our reporters to the technical department where creativity and computer skills are needed. Though talented in these areas, young employees are nevertheless worried about their future. Japan is becoming an aging society and in such environment are we still able to receive our pension? We also wonder if our jobs are stable, we feel somewhat insecure. With every generation having their own challenge to overcome, both the young and old face different obstacles in today's work environment. In Taiwan, there are currently some 420 senior citizens requiring long-term care, thus making qualified family caregivers the profession most in demand. To address the demand, local governments have established vocational training classes to train such professionals. Unfortunately, the results didn't work out according to plan. Let's find out why. Advancing with little steps is Grandma Huang, who suffers from Parkinson's and other illnesses that accompany old age and ailing health. It is up to her daughter Huang Chou-jing, who is in her 50s, to take care of her daily needs. They need to receive regular checkups, among other things. And see here, just last week I was in and out of the hospital three days in a row. As an only child, Huang Chou-jing also shoulders the task of caring for her aging father and her stroke-stricken, incapacitated husband. As if hitting the rewind button, Huang goes through the same routine every day. Hidden behind her tenacious facade is strain and grief. It has been difficult. Before, when I was at a loss what to do, I would wonder how I got myself into such a situation, and there is nobody to help me. Just when everything started to look bleak, Luckily, an extra pair of hands was extended her way. Hey, two hey, hey. Mr. Zhu is a family caregiver. With his arrival, a heavy load has been lifted off Huang Chou-jing's shoulders. Huang applied for home care assistance through the Long-Term Care Resource Management Center, which provides assistance three days a week, seven hours each day, to Huang's family. 
There are currently 6,000 caregivers like Mr. Zhu in Taiwan. Of the some 2 million elderly citizens in the country, 420,000 of them are incapacitated and require long-term assistance. Senior care centers, retirement centers and nursing homes depend on caregivers. Their job requires them to look after patients and maintain a clean and comfortable environment for them, as well as to meet their daily needs. In response to the increasing demand of an aging society, each year over 4,000 participants sign up to take part in the caregiver training program organized by the Council of Labor Affairs and local governments. I paid for this out of my own pocket. This is my job, but my family can benefit from my skills in the future. This is my first time. Since I started training as a caregiver, I've come to realize that it's not an easy job. Not only is it not easy to acquire a caregiver's license, but the real challenge begins once you're qualified. With an hourly salary of less than six US dollars and long hours, the proficiency is a 90% turn over rate. I can handle the strenuous job and the salary is acceptable, but I heard that it's actually not so much, so we have to work as much as we can. It goes without saying that it's always better to count on your own than on others. The Taiwanese government is following Japan's footsteps and mulling an act to establish a long-term care insurance program, which will ensure that senior citizens receive care upon retirement. Except, this proposed act is still being discussed at the legislative level. All of us will put on the years, who will look out for your well-being. Perhaps we should start planning for our golden years now. According to statistics, 72% of seniors suffer injury and death as a result of tripping over. To make sure seniors live in safety, the Senior Citizen Welfare and Protection Association of Yunlin County in Taiwan has raised $6 million NT dollars to help transform senior citizens' living environment. This is senior Liu Pong, who lives by himself and had limits in mobility even at a young age. Now 89 years old, Liu can hardly walk. I fell down many times in the past. I had to call others to help me get up because my legs are weak. Mr. Liu lives in this old house where he sleeps, eats and goes to the washroom in the same place. Since the floor is uneven, Liu has fallen down many times. He always falls down. Now that the floor is smooth, it will prevent him from falling down. Now with a smooth floor and a separate bathroom, Liu's sister says her brother can finally live in a safe environment. Home attendant Ling Feng Ying also says that changing seniors' living environment is an issue that everyone should pay attention to. Some of the seniors have weak legs and can't walk properly. The chances of seniors falling down are very high. Most of them suffer small injuries, but some have passed away as a result. 70% of seniors' deaths can be traced back to incidents that are related to falling. Therefore, the Senior Citizen Welfare and Protection Association of Yunlin County has raised six million new Taiwanese dollars to change senior citizens' living environment. Our focus is to look after senior safety. We hope members of the public will be more aware of this issue. As most of the seniors are vulnerable to falling, by changing their living environment, we can ensure that they can live in safety. In Taiwan, religious groups regularly conduct mercy releases, which is to release animals in captivity into the wild. Such act is seen as a way to bring good fortune into this life or the next. However, its tradition has been commercialized in modern times, where hunters now capture animals in the wild and sell them for later release. Well, look. There are five or six crabfish here. Speaking of red crabfish, here at Taipei's Fuyang Ecological Park, this wetland has suffered from a red swamp crabfish invasion.
Restaurant crayfish have been here since two years ago. In this small pond, there are over 1,000 of them, but I believe that whomever released them only let go of a few. Even though Taiwan's Society of Wilderness's volunteers conduct routine removal of foreign species, the natural ecological balance is still under attack from non-native species. Here you can see many areas that are without plants. It's because crayfish have eaten them, so submerged plants are unable to survive, and even those floating leaf plant types have suffered too. These crayfish operate in captivity in a controlled pond or caged environment. However, once you release them into the wild, you are taking the risk of spreading them uncontrollably. In fact, the largest sources of disrupting the ecosystem are these. Religious organizations often hold mercy release ceremonies where cages and cages of birds wait to fly towards their freedom. During an hour of waiting for their freedom, it's hard to tell how many die in the cages from weather conditions or the pressure of being stuck in enclosed quarters. Religious organizations think they're doing a good deed, but actually they are just contributing to the animal's death. From being captured to waiting for freedom, these animals still have to endure the torturous ritual process before actually being set free. When they are letting go of the birds, they will tap the cages. This action actually frightens the birds. However, participants will say that they have to stick to their schedule and can't waste time in waiting for thousands of birds to make their way out on their own, and so will hit the cages to force them out. According to the Environmental and Animal Society of Taiwan, annually religious groups in Taiwan hold about 750 sessions of mercy releases, in which they let go of a total of 200 million birds and spend over 6 million U.S. dollars in the process. As long as there is a market to purchase birds for mercy release, there will be people looking to make a profit from it. Streptopelia, sparrows, red turtle doves or even crested miners, these birds are all being captured in the south. They are especially hunted for those who want to release birds back into the wild. In the past, releasing animals into the wild was about releasing a captive animal. I might be spending a little money, but it was for his freedom and was a respectful practice. However, now misguided religious organization ideals are disrupting the natural balance of the ecosystem. Previously, Chinese bulbul and Taiwan bulbul were distinctly different from each other, but now it's hard to tell as the two have mixed into a hybrid. We have also seen people release giant snakeheads into the wild. That species of fish is carnivorous and will eat other fish. When you break the natural balance of the ecosystem, one might not be able to see the impact right away, but in 50 years, that's when the effects will come to light. These mercy releases are twisting out of control, and what was once considered an act of accumulating merit has turned into an act of harm instead. As the seventh lunar month is just around the corner, Ban Chao City volunteers are promoting vegetarianism in their community by offering free vegetarian lunch boxes to local businesses for two days. Volunteers hope through this event to inspire more residents to adopt a meatless diet. Ban Chao Tsuji volunteers are busy in the kitchen as plates of delicious food are prepared. To incorporate the seventh lunar month celebrations, Tsuji volunteers are not only spreading the message of vegetarianism among fellow compatriots, but also to their community as well. We ask our Tsuji brothers and sisters to visit different companies to spread the idea of adopting a vegetarian diet. <laughs> Working together to carry the lunch boxes inside, many companies are participating in this event. We treasure this opportunity to connect with them. I hope my neighbors will have the same chance to experience this as well. It's healthier to eat more vegetables and less meat. Our bodies will have more energy because of it. The staff members of this company sit down to eat their lunch together and find the taste to be a bit different from before. I normally eat light anyways. I don't like salty, oily or spicy foods, so this lunch is very suitable for me. The vegetarian diet is good for your health as well as good for the planet. We only have one earth, so if it is destroyed, then it's gone. 
Adopting a vegetarian diet not only protects the planet, but city volunteers' heartfelt lunchboxes also help local residents to change their views regarding a meatless lifestyle. Moving to Malaysia at a free clinic organized by the city Bukit Meta Jam Liaison Office, city volunteers came across a 13-year-old girl who is taking care of her grandparents on her own, and they quickly mobilized to help the family clean their unhygienic environment. Cleaning equipment in hand, 20 volunteers are coming to help clean the home of Iso Bin Rob. Join them are also nurses from a local dialysis center who checks on the health of the two seniors that depend exclusively on the care of their 13-year-old granddaughter. Moody food in the kitchen, mood on the mattress and garbage on the floors. One by one, volunteers attack these areas. Also helping with the cleaning are the family's neighbors. Seeing how they live, if we don't help them, who will? If our own parents were wheelchair bound, what would we do? For myself, I see these two seniors as my own parents. The cleaning doesn't stop with the apartment as volunteers bath and cut the hair of the two seniors. If we sweat for even a bit, we will feel uncomfortable. She probably hasn't had a shower in days to cool her down. Her hair was all sticky and greasy, so we decided to give her a bath. As Ramadan comes to an end, Muslims everywhere are getting ready to celebrate Ifad, and joining them in health and joy will be this family. Back to Taiwan, for this year's new nursing graduates starting their first day of work at the Taipei City Hospital, they are accompanied by senior nursing staff who settle their nerves and help prepare them for the challenges ahead. Taipei City Hospital head nurse takes time off from her busy schedule to show these new nurses around the medical intensive care unit. Among the new recruits is one male nurse who is excited to be starting his dream job and has big hopes for the future. I'm interested in working in the ICU. I hope by working in that area, I can learn how to better take care of those who are seriously ill and thus be a better nurse. While in the patient words, Liu Yuchen also on her first day works to understand the various protocol in patient care. Although like everyone else, Liu is nervous, she knows that under the guidance of the hospital's experienced staff, there is nothing to be afraid of. Before, I was nervous that I would not be able to adapt to the environment. After coming here, thanks to the guidance and care of the head nurses, I feel like we are at home and not in a hospital. Although the job of a nurse is not an easy one, there are still many, like this crop of new graduates, that are willing to work forth in respect, empathy and compassion to fulfill their Hippocratic Oath and city's medical mission. We go to Northern California of the United States at the end of the show. After the Hallmark apartment in Redwood City was destroyed by a fire in early July, city volunteers arrived in the aftermath to hand out consolation cash to residents who were mainly from low-income families or handicapped. Volunteers later also returned to hold a tea gathering. We'll leave you with these images. Thank you for tuning in. Goodbye.